Hello everyone, my name is John Lustria coming to you live. Uh, I'm the Education Coordinator with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and today we're going to be talking about Civil War diseases. Uh, but before we get into any of that, I'm just going to wait a few minutes, give people time to get on the, uh, the stream and share things around. Uh, if you share it around, that really helps us. Um, so I'm going to give folks some time before I really get going with this. And uh, we'll get started in just a few minutes here. So, say, um, let me see. Let me get the, uh, the comments pulled up. Hello for those of you just joining, and uh, if you don't know me, my name is John Lustria, the Education Coordinator with the National Museum of uh, Civil War Medicine. Going to be talking about Civil War diseases today, very topical. Um, and, but before I jump into that, give, some, uh, give people some time to get on the stream, go ahead and share it so that more people can, uh, can see it and get eyes on us and all that sort of thing. So that'll be very helpful if, you'd, uh, if you do that for us. How are folks doing today? Where are folks uh, watching from? See, we got uh, someone in Naperville, Illinois. Excellent. Alrighty. Got that pulled up. Very good. Got got the comments. I can now see people that uh, that comment. Um, happy Friday to everybody uh, out there. Glad you could join us today. Uh, yes, my wife is watching from downstairs, <laughs> very far away. <laughs> very good. Biglerville, PA. It's been fun as we've been doing these. We got someone in Martinsburg, Sarasota. Uh, it's been fun doing these. Uh, you know, recognizing some some names to 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 pop up regularly. It's been fun recognizing people uh, people's names and places and and things like that. This is all very exciting. Well, it's uh, really wonderful to be joined by you all today. Um, it really is a, a blessing to get to do this. Uh, admittedly, these are, you know, troubling times and, and all that sort of thing, but it is fun to kind of form this, uh, this connection uh, with people in this way. Um, got some folks in North Carolina, uh, Crossnor, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Michael, I saw you on one of the other streams this week. Uh, Wendy, of course, she's been on most of these from Telford, PA. Um, Newark, New York. Uh, Batavia, Illinois, wonderful. Um, Chris o alone, I've seen him on a few of these. Uh, this is very fun uh, to see folks. So anyway, like uh, like I said, uh, it's been wonderful to to connect to folks with this, uh, and it's it's wonderful to see you all here. Um, joining the stream with us today. Uh, before we dive in, just a, a few things. Uh, as you know, um, we're trying to do these regularly, or maybe you don't know. Um, we're trying to do these live streams regularly every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, around one o'clock. Um, there's gonna be a couple schedule changes next week. On Monday of next week, our Facebook Live video will be at 7 p.m. because that works better for the guests that we're going to have on, uh, Sarah Handley Cousins, she's going to be talking about her upcoming book about disability and union veterans. That should be a good one. So that's going to be at 7 p.m., not 1. And then instead of Wednesday next week, the program is going to be on Thursday. Um, our very own Kyle Dalton will be talking about uh, the history of germ theory and how well, it's relation, or in, in most cases, non-relation to Civil War medicine. Um, and I know he's been doing a lot of uh, new research for that, so that one should be good. But that's going to be on Thursday um, and, not, uh, and not Wednesday of next week. So just heads up, next Friday will be same time, regular time, 1 o'clock. Uh, and if you, for whatever reason, well, if you're hearing me now, you are live. But if you can't catch these live, they will exist. Uh, on our Facebook page. If you go to the museum Facebook page, you can watch all the past ones that we've done. And uh, if you know someone that doesn't have a Facebook, you can send them to our YouTube channel. Most of these videos will appear on the YouTube channel eventually, but there'll be a, 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 a little delay before that happens. And then finally, um, 
since we are closed and that's part of why we're able to, you know, why we're, we're doing these things is to kind of stay connected for one, but also, you know, keep us busy. Um, but since the museum in Frederick is closed, um, we're not receiving admissions. So it's, it's really helpful uh, if you could consider donating uh, and there, there'll be a link in the comments uh, about that. Consider donating or becoming a member and supporting uh, this sort of programming. It's, it's programs like this that we're trying to inspire a little bit of hope in these kind of bleak times. Uh, so we would love it if you consider donating or becoming a member or, you know, whatever that might look like for you. So um, now that that's uh, said, uh, I'm going to get started here shortly. I'm going to switch over to a different tab for my notes. Uh, so I won't be able to see your comments uh, for a little while, but I will check in uh, and definitely I'm going to get to uh, everyone's questions. And if you have questions, please post them in the comments. Well, I'd like to keep these, you know, uh, interactive. So Civil War diseases, you know, of course, in, uh, in a time of a pandemic, diseases, of course, uh, very topical. Um, so how did they deal with it in the Civil War? Uh, and one of the things as I was doing some research for this is, and this goes for a lot of things, in some ways, how they dealt with disease during the Civil War doesn't resemble anything that we do at all today. And in some ways, it's astonishingly similar. Uh, and that's what I find fascinating about Civil War medicine. In some ways, it's so similar, it's astonishingly recognizable. And in other ways, you barely recognize it at all. Um, so, and, and this is no exception. Uh, so I'm going to do a bunch of kind of quick hits. Uh, I'm going to kind of highlight uh, several diseases. I'm not going to go into any great detail uh, on some. If you have questions, I, I can see what I, uh, what I can do. Uh, and I'll, I'll remind people that uh, I am a historian by training. I'm not a medical professional. So all of this research that I've done is just that historical research. Um, uh, I, I'm not a doctor, but I do play one on Facebook Live uh, as I'm doing right now. So uh, before we get to some of the diseases, just want to start a little bit with the kind of medication that was at the disposal of Civil War surgeons. Uh, and there were many. Uh, Civil War surgeons had over 131 different types of medication available uh, to them. Um, a lot of those, not all, but a, a lot of them um, typically were at best useless and harmful, um, probably more often than, than certainly the soldiers would have liked them to have been. Um, that's not to say that all of them were completely ineffective, and I'm not going to go through all 131 um, for your benefit just as much as mine. Um, but I'm just going to highlight some of the more common ones. Um, and certainly the most effective ones were uh, chloroform and ether used as uh, an anesthetic. Um, and uh, Kyle Dalton gave a wonderful presentation. It's, it's, we had technical difficulties on Wednesday, so it's in three parts. But he gave a wonderful uh, presentation about uh, anesthesia in the, in the in the Civil War. So chloroform and ether, effective means of anesthesia. Um, go check out those videos uh, for more information on that. Uh, Opium-based medicines were incredibly common uh, and one of the most commonly prescribed medicines during the Civil War. Um, and that came in a variety of different uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, sometimes it would be in a pill. Um, the Union Army alone administered uh, somewhere around 10 million opium pills over the course of the Civil War. So this was a, a, a commonly administered medicine. Uh, sometimes it would be in just powder, opium powder. Um, sometimes uh, it would be in the form of morphine. Uh, sometimes it would come in the form of a, a concoction called laudanum, which is 10% uh, opium and 10% alcohol, or, or sorry, 10% alcohol and the rest opium or, or something. Now I got myself turned around. Well, anyway, it's, it's a combination of opium and alcohol, and uh, you're not going to feel much of anything uh, after you have that. Um, so opium-based medicines, there, there is the ability to kind of reduce inflammation, to numb pain, obviously commonly administered after someone has been shot, uh, of course. Uh, and then one of the other kind of common and more effective medicines, something called quinine. It's an effective treatment for malaria and other types of fevers. Um, 
Again, I'm a historian, not a doctor. I don't know why it works. It's ground up South American tree bark from a very particular tree. Uh, and as far as I know, it's still used in malaria medications uh, today. So if you have malaria during the Civil War, which we'll get to later, um, you're probably gonna be okay. Now, that was not as widely available for Southern doctors as it was for Northern doctors uh, on account of the Union blockade. Um, so those that's kind of an overview of some of the more effective drugs. Uh, and then, unfortunately, another very common drug that was administered during the Civil War um, were a variety of uh, mercury-based medications, um, which, of course, uh, don't end up going very well for most patients. Uh, and you might be wondering, why on earth are they giving so much mercury? Were they dumb? Well, part of it, they didn't quite know what they were doing, but in some cases, they would actually give that to soldiers as a purgative. The idea is if you're sick, you have something bad inside you, and if we give you mercury, that might get it out of you um, in some way. Uh, so that that's part of the reasoning behind it. Uh, and if you can believe it, that was actually a, a bone of contention during the Civil War. Not that whether mercury was good or bad, just how much mercury should be given. And there were those that said, maybe we should really back off how much mercury we give patients. And there were others that said, no, 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 we need to give them more mercury. Um, so it's one of the medical debates that raged inside the medical community at the time of the Civil War. Seems silly to us now, but these are the sort of things they were talking about. Um, so... That's just uh, a little background on what kind of medicine the doctors are working with, just to have in the back of your minds. Um, to give a brief overview uh, about disease before we get into any of the specifics, uh, disease in the Civil War uh, was a problem from the very beginning. In fact, it was probably the first enemy that most soldiers had to face. Um, before any major battle happened in the Civil War, disease was already decimating the ranks. And that would be a, a common theme throughout the Civil War. Of all deaths in the Civil War, two-thirds came as a result of disease. Uh, and again, that becomes apparent right from the beginning. And disease throughout the entire war was especially prevalent in newly formed regiments. And this was for all kinds of reasons. Um, a lot of soldiers uh, who served in the Civil War were from pretty rural areas, and as a result, uh, they had not been exposed, they had had limited contact with other people, social distancing, as we call it today. Um, they didn't have as much contact with people, they didn't uh, encounter a lot of these epidemic diseases, and so suddenly when soldiers are crammed together in tiny camps, there's no social distancing, um, these diseases that some people are immune to, but not everybody is, they start spreading very quickly, and lots of people get sick which of course is a problem, uh, and it devastated Civil War armies. And it's the same sort of thing that we're now grappling with, is how quickly disease can spread when you're very close to each other. Now, thankfully, our sort of general sanitation is higher, <laughs> it's better than uh, it was in a Civil War army camp. Um, but it, that problem of closeness uh, is, is part of the, the issue. Um, Let's see here. Um, there were, so that was one reason why these diseases spread quickly among the new recruits, especially at the beginning of the war. Um, the other kind of issue was there was very poor pre-enlistment medical screening. So at the start of the Civil War, everyone's very excited, very patriotic. Well, you know, we got to enlist, we got to get in the army. Um, and so there's pressure um, uh, on the, the, the surgeons who are basically administering like a physical, you know, to determine if they're, they're physically fit to be a soldier, to kind of get soldiers into the ranks. And in fact, some doctors would be given bonuses if they could reach a, a quota of people to get in the ranks. Uh, you know, for example, state governors, especially in the early days of the war, they want their state to look very patriotic and they don't want to lag behind because too many people are sick. Um, you know, not knowing how devastating that would be later on. And so it, part of it is about image, about, you know, upkeeping the image of, you know, Massachusetts is just as patriotic as Ohio. See, we have, you know, just as many men going into the ranks and things like that. So there, there is poor pre-enlistment screening. 
Um, they're not screening for diseases uh, as well as they should. Uh, later, uh, thankfully, as the war goes on, the physicians uh, get much more strict uh, and the requirements tighten about what disqualifies you for service. Um, if you're sick or if you have or haven't had, uh, say, the measles before, um, you may or may not be let in. So there, there are things like this that they start instituting as the war goes on. Uh, something I really want to emphasize, you know, these people aren't dumb. You know, they're aware as this goes on that this is a huge issue. They just don't really know how to combat the spread of disease. But they start kind of, some pieces start falling into place as the war goes on. Uh, humans are remarkably adaptable. Um, as I think a lot of times of crisis uh, demonstrate. So there's the, uh, the poor sanitation in army camps, the lack of social distancing, which, of course, you know, they're not thinking of, um, you know, at that time. And, you know, we're struggling to come to grips with uh, in our days. Lack of pre-enlistment screening, uh, inexperienced physicians, and lack of immunity to diseases. So all of these things uh, make you know, incredibly uh, key environments for uh, epidemic diseases to start spreading. Now, I'm going to throw out a lot of numbers uh, over the course of this little bit, and most of these numbers, partially just because they're so accessible, um, uh, are primarily from the Union Army, and that's because uh, of an incredible resource that exists out there. It's called the Medical and Surgical History of the War of the Rebellion, it's a, a list of just incredible data compiled by Union Army surgeons and published after the war. It's freely available online. It's all text searchable. Um, you know, it's more like an encyclopedia. You might fall asleep if you try to read it front to back, uh, unless you're really interested in this, in which case more power to you. Um, but if you go in there searching for something and you kind of know how to tackle it, it's an unparalleled resource. But what those numbers, um, the numbers for diseases that exist, uh, while they're very good, they don't show the full story because they don't take into account um, how crowding, exposure, exertion, malnutrition, and the psychological stress of wartime uh, might have made soldiers more susceptible to disease. And that's not taken into, into account because they're not thinking about that at the time. Uh, and one further note about these numbers, um, the Army only collected data uh, from men who are hospitalized or relieved from duty. Uh, and so there's likely uh, thousands, uh, well, countless um, numbers of unrecorded, probably more mild cases of, of some of these diseases. So while these numbers are useful, um, it's probably worth keeping that asterisk in, in the back of uh, our minds. Uh, one final note. Uh, there are two really important numbers to consider when talking about these individual diseases. Uh, the total number of cases um, and then the mortality rate. How fatal was the disease? So thankfully for us, COVID-19, um, the concern is that there will be a lot of cases, a large total number, but thankfully the mortality rate, the fatality rate is relatively speaking, low. I mean, you know, it's higher than anyone wants it. I mean, hopefully, uh, so, so th those are the, the numbers that are, that are worth keeping in mind. The total number of cases who are sick and then the mortality rate. So those are two different things uh, and they weigh differently depending on the, on the sickness. Uh, so to start out with, uh, measles. Um, like many diseases, it was most common in new recruits in the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, it was epidemic in the, the, um, the early days of the war. But as time goes on and people uh, either recover uh, or die, um, the number of cases, you know, soldiers develop immunity to it. Uh, there are, you know, kind of fewer, newer recruits. Uh, they, they get over it, and by the end of the Civil War, by July of 1865, there are almost no recorded cases uh, of the measles. So that, that number to decreases over time. So that's an example of, you know, what happens when, you know, eventually sort of more or less everybody gets it, which, I mean, it's not the case. Uh, there were only um, about 75,000 cases of the measles in the Union Army over the course of the, the entire war. And, and that's, 
you know, upwards of a million to a million and a half total troops. So, I mean, not everyone gets measles, but, but over the course of time, there's uh, an immunity that develops. And so by the end of the war, there are basically no cases uh, on record. Uh, and that disease ends up having something like a 6% mortality rate. Um, so, you know, fairly deadly, but not as deadly as some of the, the cases we will see, or uh, different diseases we'll see. Uh, next, pneumonia. Uh, pneumonia was the, the deadliest respiratory infection of the Civil War. Um, often, of course, following cases of the cold, uh, or bronchitis, or even the measles. Um, the mortality rate for, for that disease uh, was about 24%. So, um, whereas if you have the measles, that's only about a 6% mortality rate, you'll probably survive. It's much more of a roll of the dice with uh, pneumonia. And I see that I didn't write down about how many total cases there were. Um, I don't think it's, let me see here. Let's see if I can find it in my book that I have here. Um, do, 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 do. Hmm. Well, I can't seem to find it, so we'll just uh, keep things moving here. Uh, typhoid fever. Um, typhoid fever is a, an intestinal infection gotten by eating contaminated food or drinking contaminated water uh, of some sorts, and it was one of the most feared epidemics of the entire 19th century. Um, there are uh, about uh, 75,000 cases among uh, Union troops, uh, and of that number, about 27,000 end up dying. So that's a 36% mortality rate. It's one of the most deadly diseases of the entire uh, uh, Civil War. Uh, and like many diseases, typhoid fever was at its worst in the first year of the Civil War. Um, and during that time, uh, almost 6% of the entire Union Army was diagnosed with typhoid fever. Uh, and in the first year of the war, literally 2% of the entire army uh, end up dying from typhoid fever. Um, so it, it's epidemic in the, in the early years. Uh, the following year, about 5% of the entire army has it, and about 1.7% of the entire army dies in the second year of the Civil War uh, from typhoid fever. But as the war goes on, for the remainder of the war, the final two years, uh, no more than 1.5% uh, of the army's strength, so only 1.5% of 1.3 million soldiers um, end up getting uh, affected by typhoid, and less than 1% ends up uh, dying from typhoid fever of that chunk in the last two years of the war. So um, the, the rates go down over time. Now, um, there weren't many uh, effective treatments for typhoid fever. Um, the doctors tried treating the symptoms by giving pain relievers uh, or trying to give quinine for, uh, to lower the fever. Uh, they tried different diets that wouldn't be painful for the soldiers to digest. One of the symptoms was that in the intestines you could develop uh, things that would basically make anything passing through your intestines, like food, um, incredibly painful. So they're, they're trying things, um, but they're only treating symptoms and they're not getting to the root bacterial cause. Um, now, about two to three percent of typhoid patients ended up becoming chronic carriers. Um, and they would then go on to infect countless numbers, uh, especially uh, in camps, you know, where the sanitation was so poor during the war. Uh, now, we don't know, you know, how many people, of course, the, those, you know, two to three percent of people that had typhoid fever, you know, how many they ended up infecting. We can think of them sort of like asymptomatic people with uh, COVID-19. Um, now, in this case with typhoid fever, and it's a little gross, um, the only way that that could be spread uh, would come out in feces. Um, that being said, um, army sanitation is not great, and it's still very possible for that to spread, uh, especially in hospitals. Um, and typhoid fever, it was not uncommon um, for that to uh, to spread to hospital workers. Um, sort of famously, um, typhoid fever uh, ended the nursing career, thankfully not by death, um, but it ended the nursing career of uh, Louisa May Alcott. Uh, she survived, but her supervisor, Hannah Ropes, 
ended up dying of typhoid fever. So being a healthcare worker during the Civil War was uh, a dangerous business, um, especially when you kind of don't know how these things get transmitted. Now, if you managed to survive typhoid fever, uh, you, would, you ended up having immunity from the disease. And doctors at the time recognized that. They recognized that it wouldn't come back around again if you'd have had it, or if you had had it, uh, because they had experience with certain other diseases that were like this, smallpox, for example. Um, there was an effective vaccine for smallpox that involved, um, this is a little gross again, taking the scab of someone who had smallpox and kind of basically putting that in, you know, in your 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 bloodstream, exposing yourself to that. And in that way, you would get sort of a minor dose of the disease and your body builds antibodies to fight it. They're not really sure exactly why this works, but they know that it works. And so they're aware that, you know, there are vaccines and things for certain things like this. And so the doctors recognize that typhoid patients that survive end up having immunity. And so that's a big reason why the infection rate goes down over the course of the Civil War, um, especially when you get towards the end. Um, there's sort of fewer new recruits uh, heading towards, you know, the, the army camps uh, and things like that. So um, that's a, a big reason. Uh, now, one other kind of related disease that was categorized in a different way in the medical and surgical history is something called typhoid pneumonia. Uh, just based off of how they talked about it at the time, it's hard to know whether this is a specific type of pneumonia that went hand in hand with typhoid, if it was just regular pneumonia that came after somebody had typhoid, uh, or if it was something else entirely. Um, but it gets categorized not as typhoid fever or as pneumonia, but it gets categorized as typhoid pneumonia. That's like a separate disease as far as they're concerned. And so whenever you're kind of totaling up these numbers, like I said, they're good, but they're not perfect. Um, this whole typhoid pneumonia business, it's really hard to know um, what to do uh, with that. Uh, next, I want to talk about one of the most uh, common uh, diseases of the Civil War, and that is diarrhea and dysentery. Um, and that doctors at the time uh, conflated those two terms. They were not entirely, but oftentimes synonymous. Um, they, they are a little bit different. Diarrhea is just sort of not solid uh, bowel movements, and then dysentery is sort of bloody stools and probably indicative of something much more serious. Um, now, this was easily the most common uh, disease uh, of all, you know, of, of the entire Civil War. Um, there are 1.5 million reported cases of diarrhea and dysentery in the Union Army alone. And think, of course, of how many went unreported, and that's not counting the Confederate Army. So we're probably talking upwards, you know, of 3 million cases. Basically, if you served in the Army, uh, you were guaranteed at some point to have some form of, of diarrhea or or dysentery. That um, was pretty much bound to happen just depending on how serious it was. Um, now a lot of that has to do with, again, poor sanitation, but also kind of general nutrition um, that the soldiers are getting. Uh, a soldier's diet consists primarily of some sort of meat, um, you know, pork or, or beef or something like that. Um, Cornbread, uh, if you're a southern soldier, or hardtack, if you're a northern soldier, you can make hardtack at home. Six parts flour, one part water, bake until golden brown. I don't recommend it. It's not very good, um, but you can make it if you want. Um, beans uh, and coffee uh, and conspicuously absent are fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, now, there were there was something called desiccated vegetables, which is sort of dehydrated, uh, and the idea was you're supposed to make it as part of a soup, um, but by boiling the vegetables, you're taking some of the nutritional quality away, so um, there's no regular system to get fresh fruits and vegetables to soldiers on the front lines. Um, that's not to say 
no Civil War soldier ever ate, you know, a fresh fruit or a vegetable. They could get them by foraging. Sometimes the government would send them. Um, sometimes they would get them from home. Uh, a lot of times um, aid organizations like the United States Sanitary Commission or the countless numbers of ladies aid associations, uh, both north and south, would hold campaigns to to send fresh produce to the uh, to the soldiers on the front lines. Um, scurvy, for example, was a disease that um, we've known how to treat for, for centuries now, and they certainly knew how to deal with that at the time of the Civil War. They knew how important um, produce was. And there's a great Sanitary Commission campaign slogan, um, which goes, don't send your loved letter, or oh, shoot, I ruined the punchline. Don't send your loved one a letter, send him an onion, um, which is just, uh, a great slogan. Um, so they're, they're conscious of this sort of thing. Now, uh, if you had diarrhea long enough, it was eventually classified as chronic diarrhea. And again, that was classified as a totally different disease from regular diarrhea, chronic and then regular. Um, the symptoms are largely the same, but ended up having a higher mortality rate. And that's probably because, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the you know your health nutritional value that starts declining over time, um, and so that's probably why uh, fewer survived. Um, so between all the diarrheas and dysenteries, it led to uh, over fifty thousand combined deaths between both sides. Um, so that's both Union and Confederate combined, um, and that makes it. Uh, more than likely the deadliest disease of the entire Civil War. Um, so uh, there it is. Now, of course, 50,000 total deaths, the mortality rate for this is quite low. For talking arguably 3 million cases or certainly over a million, um, 50,000 is, is sort of a drop in the bucket. But um, it, it is, of course, frustrating to us today to know that at least some of those could have been prevented with uh, just a few extra apples and, and, and onions. Um, anyway, uh, quick note about cholera. So cholera was one of the most deadly diseases of the entire 19th century, one of those epidemics that would come around and would just kind of devastate um, cities uh, during the, the 19th century. But thankfully, there wasn't an outbreak um, during the Civil War. Well, there wasn't a major outbreak, I should say. Um, but immediately after the Civil War, the United States government instituted a quarantine blockade to prevent an 1865 outbreak in the kind of Mediterranean area, um, Italy and Greece, that, that region, from coming to the United States. So they're aware that this thing can kind of spread. They had received news that that was happening. And so they, uh, they, the United States government instituted a blockade, knowing that the last thing that the country needed after going through a civil war was for there to be a massive cholera outbreak. Now, malaria was uh, an extremely common uh, civil war disease. Um, nearly uh, almost a million cases in the Union Army alone, uh, but it was not very deadly. Uh, there were only about 4,000 deaths uh, or less than a 1% mortality rate. Um, so again, that's one of those diseases where the, you know, the sheer number of infections is high, but the mortality rate is low, thankfully. Um, and part of that was likely due to the fact that uh, that was a disease that they could effectively treat at the time. They had access to quinine, um, which uh, certainly helped with things. Uh, yellow fever, uh, another incredibly deadly epidemic disease of the 19th century, um, you know, where mortality rates, depending on which city it hit, could range anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. Um, there were only 1,300 reported cases in the Union Army during the Civil War, but true to form, it was very deadly. So there was a 32% mortality rate for those 1,300 uh, cases. So thankfully, it wasn't more. Uh, there wasn't more outbreaks of yellow fever uh, during the Civil War, so there were fewer total cases, but it was still just as deadly of a disease as it was before the Civil War. Um, and an example of this, um, they were the uh, um, 
Civil War doctors at the time were conscious about trying to stop this from spreading when it did break out. Uh, so New Orleans especially, um, there had been several severe outbreaks of yellow fever before the Civil War. Uh, and the Union Army captured New Orleans pretty early in the Civil War in 1862. Um, and when, uh, to prevent outbreaks of uh, yellow fever, they instituted uh, a, a quarantine. So if new vessels were coming in via the Mississippi River or the Gulf of Mexico, they would have to, um, people staying, you know, people on the ships that were coming into port would have to stay on board for 40 days. Um, even worse than the, you know, 14 day quarantines that people are, you know, being told to undergo if you start exhibiting symptoms of, of COVID-19. Um, 40 days was what they thought a quarantine period was uh, for yellow fever. Um, so uh, that just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea uh, about that. Um, getting down towards the end here, uh, acute rheumatism or acute rheumatic fever, uh, similar, slightly different yet related. Um, so uh, Basically, it's, you know, rheumatism, aches and pains, but this uh, label, officially labeled acute rheumatism, uh, it comes with fever, uh, extremely inflamed joints, uh, and if this sort of thing went on long enough, the, the doctors classified it again as chronic rheumatism, and there's uh, somewhere about 150,000 cases uh, of this in, in the Union Army, and ultimately about 15,000 Union soldiers uh, were discharged from service for this. Um, but again, thankfully for this disease, the mortality rate is low. So high um, infection rate, well, I'm not sure infection is the right word for this, but uh, high incidence uh, of, of this disease, um, but low mortality rate, less than 1% of those affected ended up uh, dying of this. And that same thing, high rate of infection, low mortality rate goes for uh, sexually transmitted diseases during the Civil War. Um, there are about 100,000 cases of gonorrhea and 80,000 cases of syphilis um, in the Union Army during the Civil War, but uh, between the two diseases, uh, only about 129 end up dying from them. Um, and just uh, two final notes as we start, uh, as I start trying to a close here. Um, one thing you haven't heard me talk about at all is mental health uh, in the Civil War. And regrettably, that's because there was very little understanding of, uh, you know, anything related to depression or uh, what we would call today PTSD. Um, they just don't have the language or the understanding uh, for all that sort of uh, stuff. So, of course, in any war, there's going to be all kinds of people dealing with severe depression. Anytime people are getting killed, you know, around you, of course, it's going to lead to severe bouts with, the, with depression uh, or even post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, they identified this, um, you know, this these phenomenons during the Civil War, but they called it all manner of different things. Um, they called it homesickness. They called it nostalgia. They called it old soldier's disease. They called it uh, irritable heart. There was all manner uh, of um, of names that they called it, and, and there, you know, plenty more than that. Um, in some cases, um, you know, as with homesickness, which is, you know, officially listed as a disease in the medical and surgical history. Uh, sometimes soldiers would be told to eat a more hearty diet, and that would, you know, to remind them of mama's cooking or something like that, and that would kind of get them back on their feet. And in some cases, a little bit of rest maybe was all they needed, but in a lot of cases, of course, it's going to be a little more intensive than that. So, um, unfortunately, all those who suffered from especially PTSD don't go treated in a, in a good way um, and in some cases end up, uh, in a lot of cases, end up being put in insane asylums because people at the time just don't really know how to, you know, interact with, with those folks. And so that is one of the many tragic leg legacies of uh, Civil War medicine. And then one final thing that is extremely important um, in, and it's, it's chronicled uh, well in the medical and surgical history. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, African-American soldiers got sick and died at a higher rate than white soldiers. Um, so 
uh, in in terms of disease, we're talking about a, a 2.9% mortality rate for white soldiers and a 5% mortality rate for white soldiers. Now we're talking percentages. The numbers are obviously heavily skewed towards white soldiers in terms of total deaths, because there were more uh, who served. Um, but the percentages really get to the to the heart of this. And it's hard to say exactly what was the cause of this, but it this disparity between deaths between white and black soldiers. Um, it can suggest a number of things, including uh, poor health when enlisting, um, which is certainly possible. A number of the African-American soldiers who served uh, were formerly enslaved and from rural areas. As we talked about earlier, if you're from rural areas, you probably haven't been exposed to a lot of these uh, epidemic diseases of the day. Um, and when you're uh, enslaved, your sort of general health and nutrition likely wasn't that great. Uh, and so those two things certainly could uh, contribute to that. Or the other thing it can suggest is that African-American soldiers did not receive equal medical treatment as with white soldiers. And that's uh, certainly possible. Um, although it does bear noting the death rate for soldiers admitted to field hospitals for wounds uh, is exactly the same for both black and white soldiers. So it suggests that they at least received equal treatment in emergency situations. Now in hospitals, when they're sick, harder to, to, to put our finger on that, but that is uh, something that, that happens over the course of the Civil War. So that's most of what I have to say. Hopefully you found that uh, interesting. I'm gonna now flip over and start going through the comments. Um, I just saw one pop up. Are these videos saved? Yes, they all exist on our Facebook page. We're developing, uh, I think, a pretty cool library of these videos, uh, and they will all appear on our YouTube channel uh, eventually. Um, and if you enjoy these programs, consider donating to the museum or becoming a member. It helps us more than you can possibly imagine. Um, so now I'm going to head back up to the, the top of the comments, start working my way through any questions that may have popped up. Um, hopefully those that still ask the, the question are, are still on the stream here. Um, okay. Oh, thank you, Brian. I'm glad you think this shirt is a nice color. Um, let's see. Uh, was TB, tuberculosis, uh, a problem during the war, or was that mostly later in the 1880s and 90s? Uh, Song wants to know. Um, yes, it, it wasn't a huge problem. It wasn't one of the, the kind of principal diseases that uh, ravaged the armies. Um, let me kind of flip through the the index of this book that I have here. I want to make sure I give you the best answer I can. Uh, but from what I know off the top of my head, um, it wasn't sort of a, a massive issue. Um, let's see here. Uh, tuberculosis, also known as consumption. Let's see here. Uh, and by the way, there's a great book um, when you can come back to the um, National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Um, we have a wonderful book uh, called uh, I Am Perhaps Dying. Uh, it's a, a, a journal that a, a very, very intuitive um, a young southerner, um, think, I think 16 years old or something, he had sort of a rare form of TB during the Civil War. And he kind of medically documents his, his uh in his life and his experience with TB. So it, it certainly was an issue. Uh, okay, let's see here. So uh, about 20,000 Union soldiers were discharged uh, for tuberculosis or consumption uh, during the Civil War. So uh, it was something that, you know, was an issue. It wasn't as uh, epidemic as some of the other diseases at the time, uh, but it was, uh, it was around. Uh, and it was uh, a notable cause. In fact, it was the, the second leading cause for a medical discharge from the army. Gunshot wounds uh, and amputations being, of course, the runaway number one. 
Um, let's see, Robert asked, to what degree did nurses uh, contract infectious diseases? Uh, I wish I could say for sure, it's hard to say, um, but it, it, it was an issue. Um, Clara Jones, who was a, a nurse who served during the Civil War, one of the, um, the doctors that she worked with assured her that she could not um, uh, serve as a nurse and basically not get a disease. It was impossible. Uh, to be healthy. Uh, and indeed, Clara Jones contracted typhoid fever uh, during the Civil War, which she thankfully recovered from. Um, she was none too happy about that either because it uh, made her go on bed rest, which uh, wasn't her forte. Let's see. Uh, dysentery, not the same as conception. I see uh, Susan helped him out there. Uh, got some folks from Wisconsin watching. Very exciting. Okay, let me see. Okay. Let's see, did many go AWOL or just leave the field? Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, um, but that was something that happened. Uh, AWOL stands, of course, for absence, absent without leave. Uh, that was something that happened for sure. Um, I'm sure there are numbers about that. I don't have them in front of me. Um, that would depend heavily on how close you were to your home. So of course, um, uh, people deserting from the ranks, uh, if they were closer to home, uh, they were more likely to go. Like for example, there's a, a group of um, General Lee's Confederate Army that takes a, um, a sojourn to Tennessee and they end up fighting at the Battle of Chickamauga. Uh, and units that were in that command from Tennessee and Georgia desert at a much higher rate than they did when they were serving in Virginia. Because of course it's easier to get to Tennessee and Georgia when you're in Tennessee than it is when you're in Virginia. So there are factors like that um, that, that come into play. Uh, now in terms of if you have a disease, um, thinking in, in the context of this, um, again I don't really know. Um, it depends on what your your thoughts as a soldier were about going to the doctor. Uh, some were not too keen on going to see the regimental surgeon. Um, some were convinced that that would help them. In a lot of cases, it did. Um, but if you were convinced that you could receive better care outside of the army, uh, I'm certain that that was motivation for at least some soldiers to, to leave the army, but I don't know numbers. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Jimmy says, how did they handle the vermin population that increased during the devastation of the communities? They had, um, they had to devastate the overall health of citizens after the conflict. I don't know enough about numbers to know if, you know, say rat infestations were dramatically higher after the war. Uh, you know, I'm sure that they were perhaps in some southern communities like Richmond, where there are significant burned out areas. There's just less human oversight to kind of keep an eye on that sort of thing. Uh, but I really don't know if there were any efforts or even if there was a significant increase uh, in that sort of thing. Let's see, uh, Christine asks, what about disease from parasites like yellow fever, tick-borne diseases uh, that would have not had a name then? Well, you just hit on the trick. Uh, if they didn't have a name then, they didn't know to count them uh, as such. So like I talked about with typhoid pneumonia, um, that could be any number of things. It could be either typhoid fever, it could be pneumonia, it could be something else entirely that isn't either typhoid or pneumonia. Um, so that's just one example, but there are examples where, you know, they don't know uh, what to call certain things and it could be lumped in with, oh, you just have a remittent fever and when it's actually, you know, something else entirely. Um, so, but you're, you're absolutely right. There were all kinds of uh, parasitic diseases that spread during the Civil War, no question. Um, and we have a great uh, article on our blog that talks about some of them. Um, if you go to civilwarmed.org and you type in parasite into the search bar, it should pop up. Um, uh, and yellow fever, thankfully, there weren't a lot of cases of that. So some of them were pretty minor. Some of them were, were pretty major. Um, there, were, there, there was one, and of course, I... The, all the diseases started to blend together a little bit, but there was one that, that was lice-borne, uh, one disease that was borne by lice. So um, 
I'm not sure how aware they were that the parasites were the carriers. Um, now, in the case of malaria, they were aware that mosquitoes carried that, um, or at least that they tended to localize in swampy regions anyway. Um, so there was some awareness about this, but um, not not quite where you know where we are today. So that's a, a tough question to answer, but that kind of gives you sort of an idea. Um, oh, good. I'm I'm glad, Anne, you got to hang with us on your lunch break. Um, coming in late, uh, I know Ryan's been on a lot of these from Colorado. Good to see him. Let's see. Thanks for uh, so much for offering these interesting presentations, taking a break from sometimes dull work tasks. Uh, glad to help, Jackie. Uh, let's see. Annette says, uh, when did they finally give up on mercury for treatment? Um, that's a great question. I'm not sure when they finally dropped that. Um, it was after the Civil War, um, which is why I'm not as well versed in it. Um, uh, but the the Surgeon General at the time, William Hammond, um, the well, William Hammond made a lot of enemies during the Civil War, but um, he, uh, the, the sitting Surgeon General, uh, wanted to kind of dial back on the amount of mercury given, and, and that was received very poorly, and that was the excuse given basically to fire him as Surgeon General. Um, and again, I say the excuse. There are other people that just wanted him out for a variety of reasons, but it's, it's hilarious to us today, of course, to look back and say, wait, so the guy that didn't want Mercury um, was told not to be Surgeon General anymore? <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure when they finally gave up on Mercury as medical treatment. Uh, I, I love how I'm going through these questions like, hmm, that's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> um, Let's see. Researched a soldier uh, question that requested a pension due to chronic diarrhea throughout his life after the war. How frequent was this a disturbing, uh, disabling condition for soldiers after the war? Uh, pretty frequent uh, because, like I said, basically every soldier ends up having uh, diarrhea. It was not uncommon um, for that to kind of stick with them over the course of, uh, of the war. And so Chronic uh, diarrhea was a very common thing to, to submit for disability on a pension application. That and, of course, not having a limb. Those were uh, two of the most common um, that came up. Let's see. Vultures came to Gettysburg in great numbers after the battle, and that helped to re reduce diseases, says Patricia. Uh, I, I, suppose, uh, I suppose it might. Let's see. Um... Uh, right, Julie mentioned that, uh, yep, Surgeon General Hammond was uh, relieved of command. Uh, Christopher says, I know they were still using mercury uh, preparations as syphilis treatment into the 1920s and early 1930s. Okay, wow. So uh, mercury still being used well into the, um, into the, the 20th century. Uh, well, and, you know, I guess if you think about it, mercury thermometers, which, of course, is, you know, not medical treatment, but mercury thermometers were... Um, you know, were common at least into the 1990s. Um, so I, I'm sure that the existence of mercury as treatment, um, how long that went on could surprise us. Um, and that's the, uh, the bottom of the comments section. Uh, well, thanks again so much, everyone, for, for joining us today. Really, really appreciate you tuning in. Um, I know I had fun talking about epidemic diseases as much as you can have fun um, talking about epidemic diseases. Great to connect with all of you out there. Uh, please like our Facebook page. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more awesome content like this. Um, we'll be back next week, uh, Monday um, at 7 p.m., not at 1 p.m., Monday at 7 um, we'll be back um, talking about disabled union veterans uh, and the, the civil war. So, uh, that promised to be good. So yeah, like our Facebook page, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And, uh, if, if, uh, you're able, it would really help us if you could make a, a donation or become a member. Uh, you are the reason that we're able to keep doing these sort of things. So, uh, thank you so much to those of you that have. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.